Hello. Long time no see. We're back for another live. We're going to be talking with Mike Sagoon, who is a men's coach and a big part of Every Man, one of our fave companies. And he helps lead retreats. He also has his own company called The Unshakable Man. And he is basically just committed to being the best version of himself that he can be, helping men understand the value of vulnerability and helping... Am I on the BBXX account? I hope I am. I always forget to pay attention to these things and I don't even realize. Hello! How do I add you? Let's see. Here we go. Oh, good. I am on the BBX. <laughs> Loading. Here. Yes, Hello. you are. On, yes, you are on the BBXX account. <laughs> I was like, I don't even know where I am. <laughs> in, so, in the literal and the metaphorical sense, where am I? What is time? What is going on? Am I'm just I'm here. here. Talking to myself, and I don't know where I am. It's the same thing I do offline these days. <laughs> what has this quarantine done to us? <laughs> we don't even know we're here. <laughs> well, what has this quarantine done to us? It's definitely, I feel like that'll be a long road before we really realize you know what? It was interesting. Somebody yesterday asked me, how long in, do you think until we go back to normal? As if one, as if I knew the answer to that. But interesting because what is normal? What is our operational definition of normal? Will things ever go back to normal? Yada, yada, yada. Yeah. I mean, my husband and I were talking about this yesterday. And I mean, some some experts are saying it could be two to three years before things are quote unquote back to normal. Right. Whatever that looks like. Right. And I think normal for many of us right now might look like, when do we like, when can we just stop the social distancing? When can we stop using buckets of hand sanitizer and spraying down our grocery yeah. bags? And like, when, when like that to me feels like normalcy. Yeah. And and it could be a while. Right. Because that, all of that is about the separation between us. And I think I could get obviously used to working from home. I worked from home already, you know, get used to a certain amount of physical distancing with strangers, et cetera. But it's that barrier that doesn't allow for intimacy with the people you do know and love that yes. is, is the, the difficult part. Yes. I think. And then that distrust, not distrust, but that kind of built in doubt or, or you have to, you know, you can't allow other people to be in, in your life or near you or a part of you in the same way. And so I yeah. think that is kind of the biggest part. And once at least that first level can be dissolved, I think then we could yeah, start to get back to some familiar place, at least yeah. if not normal, you know, familiar. I mean, what I, what I was thinking was like, if there's one thing that this virus is teaching us, it is teaching us how to long for each other again, how to create intimacy with each other again, how to create connection, how to, how to step, step inwards instead of step outwards from each other right? Yeah. Like if there's one thing that this virus is teaching us, it's y'all, you guys have been so disconnected that it's time for you to get reconnected again. And I'm going to show you that what this feels like to be disconnected, to truly be disconnected yeah. and not to be able to touch anyone or to be in another person's space. Like, yeah. let me, let me, mother nature is like, let me teach you what connection feels like, what you are at your core, what you always have been is like this human being that wants to connect and I'm going to take that away from you because you've forgotten what that feels like. Right, right, right. 
like, oh, you loved staying home and watching Netflix during the week, and you know, you could have didn't decided not to go out, decided not to meet up with people. Well, here you go, or decided not to. Yeah, all of that. And the physical touch aspect, I think, is is huge. And I think in, you know, Latin America, much more so than in the United States, where I think people are desperate for that contact. But we as a culture don't really use physical touch that much. Wonder if that will change. Hopefully, you know, this distance won't carry over and kind of become the new normal, hopefully people will, in whatever ways, learn a lot from this and kind of re-establish their normal where they would like it to be after all the learnings that come from this rather than perhaps where it was before. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, here in Mexico, I'm in Mexico right now, and touching and kissing and holding and hugging is so ingrained into this culture, right? Like, you can't not go to a party and not hug or kiss someone. Yeah. Like, it is, it is just part of what we do. And yeah. even here, it like, so we kind of, here in Mexico, we, it was like a, a, it took us a while for us to get to this place of quarantine and social distancing. But in my town, there are so many American and Canadian immigrants that the town kind of like, before the Mexican government said, hey, everyone yeah. social distance, we kind of took it upon ourselves to say, you know what, no, like let's just social distance. And so right about the time um, California started to quarantine and say, hey, like we're closing everything down, our town started to do the same thing. Like we're, we're, we're putting limits, we're, we're canceling all public events, we're doing all this stuff, right? And right when that was happening, I went to a baby shower and there were maybe 50 peop- to 55 people there and it was like this awkward, like, oh, like, are we gonna hug right now? Like, right, should we right. do this? Like, I, I, I want to hug you, but I also don't feel yeah. safe to do this. And, and it's odd. Like, we've had, we've also had, um, like, friends come over to drop off produce, and our friends, we're like, we're super touchy feely, and and every time they've come over, we're like, oh, like, oh. I want to hug yeah. you so much. I yeah. want to give you a kiss and I can't. And like, yeah. it is, it is so, so weird and exhausting too, right? To, to think yeah. about, to always have to think about that. To like calculate everything. Yeah. Right. And to put up more barriers than we already do or more filters Absolutely. than we already do. But yes. I love that part you mentioned about teaching us how to long for each other again I think that's Mm. amazing and I rarely ever use that word or that expression I think it's fantastic longing it's such a it's such a beautiful yeah yeah it's kind of like nostalgia which I don't like because it's in one way not a pleasant feeling or there's some sadness behind it but there's also happiness because you're generally only nostalgic for times you would want to go back to where you like to remember or that were good. Mm-hmm. And so it's that same mixed energy that mm-hmm. is both kind of the negative and the positive or that negative because it was something positive. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, Jerry and I always talk about, we, we've been married for three years, almost four years, been together for eight years. And we always talk about how important physical space from each other is so healthy for our relationship because what it does is it creates this feeling of longing for each other, yeah. right? So like when we have intentional physical space from each other, we're like, yeah, great, awesome. Because I want to long you. I want to long for you. I want to like crave you. I want to like, I want to, I want to be in a space where I can't wait to hold you again, you know? That's amazing. And, it's, yeah. and, and that is such a beautiful feeling. It's such a beautiful feeling to, yeah. to have in your body. How do you think you could do that? I mean, outside of quarantine recommendations for that. But then I would say, are there any kind of makeshift ways to do that when now we obviously don't have as much space within which to create Mm -hmm. that literal or perhaps, you know, there are ways to create a more metaphorical space in a way 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like intimacy during this time like how can we increase well yeah if you know i'm sure there's some people who would like to long for their partner but if they're right there all the time right now maybe they're not so how to create that space if not literally then metaphorically in terms of having intentional time where you're focusing on your different work or doing things to kind of help create that that disconnect so that you can kind of have different phases and come back together versus that constant, yeah. you know, there's no variety, there's no change. So it's just kind of this plateau level of energy. Yeah, to- you know, like it, I, a lot of my friends in San Francisco and in Oakland live with their partners in small apartments, small-ish apartments, where it's like studio, it's one bedroom, and all of them are working from home. And yeah. they've like introduced this new dynamic in their relationship where they're like, oh shit, we're, we're together 24 seven now. And yeah. uh, we don't have this built in time apart from each other. And now we are learning some things about each other that we've never really knew because now we see more of each other. And one, I think that's totally natural. And I think, I think it's healthy for us to be aware of that. But how do we, if we do live in a tiny apartment, a small studio apartment, how do we create that intentional space? And I think that's a question that so many people are asking themselves. So many of my friends are asking themselves right now. I don't know how to do that, right? Like, I don't know how to, like, do we put up a barrier? Do we put our headphones in? I think one thing that's been working really well for some of my friends is that we create the intentional time of not talking, like from, from, mm. not, from 9 to 12, I am in the zone. I am on my computer. I'm doing work. I have my headphones in. And I'm sorry, but I'm not going to talk to you from this time. Yeah. And then, and then maybe we, get, we have lunch together from 12 to 1. Yeah. And, then, and then from 1 to 4, again, like this is like in the zone. Yeah. I'm at work. Um, yeah. And or I think on the it, weekend, it could be a puzzle or, you know, working at, or doing something where you're in that zone. And since you know, obviously you can't literally create the space. There are certain activities that kind of transcend time and space. Yes. If you get really into a puzzle or really into a workout, you can easily forget where you are and yes. therefore you could easily forget who's around you and kind of get that liberated feeling metaphorically yes. in a way of being a part. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think part of that is also like, what about reading a book? right? Finding, yeah. finding a book that you can just like bury yourself into. I just, I just started reading the Harry Potter books again. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. I had to take a break because I was just You're like, actually now I them. don't want quarantine <laughs> to end, except you'll be done with them in probably two weeks anyway. Well, I, I mean, like I had to stop because I was just like blazing right through them. But yeah. I was finding myself in those moments of like, wow, I just like, I just went through four hours of my day and my husband and I didn't talk for four hours and now we can you're in another world we're I I was I I was in I was in I was in Hogwarts (laughs) yeah (laughs) but but yes I did find myself in this state of almost flow right yeah it is almost like when my husband and I bought three puzzles when this whole thing went down we bought like a two 500 piecer and a thousand piecer and we broke up one of the 500 piecers and we literally stood there for three hours and did not talk. <laughs> had had music yeah. Or are you like, have you seen this one? Uh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> he was like yeah, groaning yeah, exactly. and moaning, <laughs> like animal <laughs> instinct communication. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but like we were in the zone together, right? And it felt mm-hmm. it, it did feel affectionate and intimate. We were doing the same thing together. But we're, there was also this barrier in between us because we were still focused in our own, I guess, yeah. train, train of thought in our own flow. Yeah, being alone right. together, that kind of thing. Yeah. And I think that's different from sitting down and watching TV. Yeah. Right? And getting caught up on it, like binging, binging a series together. I think that's totally different. Like finding activities together that you might be, you could do the thing together or yeah. you can sit in your own space and participate in, in almost like a same behavior or like in the same activity uh, together. Yeah. Right? Like and that's, reading. Yeah. 
activity in the literal sense, it's it's active versus watching TV seems like it could be called passivity, you know, the, mm-hmm. the opposite, because you're not actively participating in it. You're kind of absorbing it as, um, yeah, a passive participant. Right. Um, You mentioned hugging briefly before, and I wanted to tell you that yesterday when I was scheduling some of our social media stuff, we had uh, an interview with Owen Marcus that went out today. Oh, yeah. Or Yoda. Yodi. Yeah. (laughs) Um, We, I looked up, I went on to Unsplash and Pexels, which are both kind of copyright free photo databases and I put in men hugging and there was nothing Mm. literally on unsplash there was not a single photo that came up of men hugging and on pexels there was one photo that it was really really dark I think it was two men I couldn't really tell who who look were about to kiss (laughs) That was it. Yeah. It's as if the database of the world, you put in intimate relationships between men and you either have nothing or you have, you know, one couple who are demonstrating a more sexual romantic relationship. And then there's just nothing. Nothing. Because that doesn't exist, apparently. It was this just crazy. I was dumbfounded Uh i was i really really dumbfounded and it just is this filter that it seems like you know the whole thing you can't be what you don't see if the photos where the majority of companies are getting all their photos what we're using for advertisements what you know we're being exposed to i don't know how does that filter the way we think if we're not seeing it how are we supposed to know that men can should be hugging touching each other being close having intimate relationships and then it doesn't even have to be one of these you know either non-existent or okay they're dating yeah it was just yeah. mind-boggling and i know that you guys use a lot of original photos and i've always mm-hmm. noticed oh every man you curates takes their own photos at the retreats you guys also you and your husband take a lot of photos and it had never occurred to me that perhaps it was because there are none elsewhere I mean, well, what's interesting is like, I bet you if you, if you put in the search engine or on Unsplash, women hugging. Oh, I did. I did. And yeah, a lot came up. Oh, my a God. Yeah. Came up. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. It's like that, that's crazy to me. And, and yet, it, it, that's also, it, that feels, um, that's just not part of my world anymore. Right? Yeah. Like men, men not hugging is. Yeah not a part of my world anymore so right, it's like it's, right that is like so it that feels weird like it's surprising to me yeah but it's yeah, also yeah. not surprising to me that there aren't any photos of of in hey eb yeah hey, ebenezer's on here hi brother um hello <laughs> <laughs> but but it's like when when things like that happen like um because my world is so i i i surround myself with conscious men i surround myself with men's work practitioners I facilitate men's retreats where, where intimacy, male to male intimacy is, it is a standard, right? Yeah. It is just like, this is what we do. That when I, when I think about something like that, where I Google, oh shoot, like let me Google men hugging or let me Google on, or put on Unsplash men hugging and nothing comes up. That's like a, oh really? Yeah. Like it's, it's 2020, why, why not? Yeah. But it's also and, just not part of my world anymore, right? right? And so that reminder, because I had the same thing happen. It just hadn't occurred to me, especially because, you know, the photos I'm seeing, I see your photos all the time. I see the photos from every man all the time. So going on and being kind of jolted back into that reality that the rest of the world probably has, you know, exposure only to that, if not very limited exposure to this other voice, this other look, this other level of intimacy was just kind of a reminder that, okay, yeah. This is where we really are still. Yeah. And, you know, we've got a long, long ways to go. And so yeah. how can we get that message out there to, to those people? And well, get we our need, photos on pictures. Unsplash. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> I know. As we soon as this is over. 
hey, we could do distance photo shoots. <laughs> I mean, gonna... there's something called Photoshop, right? Yeah. <laughs> Photoshopping the arms around each other. Yeah. So that was just fascinating to me. Um, yeah. Okay, so I had written down a list of kind of just random questions Ooh. that I thought, because I thought, okay, well, there are those New York Times 36 questions, and there are all these lists, and then I also thought, oh, well, I also have some questions that some of them might be better. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Let's do it. Or to mix Let's it up. It. So I thought we could just go through and, and pick a few random ones. Let's do it. So one question that I've been asking people this week is, how have you changed in the past year? And how have you changed in the past five and 10 years? Mm. The past year, what month? It's April. I got to like think back in the last year. So in the last year, I um, grew my business. I uh, welcomed in a business partner. I, he's basically our CEO. Um, and I moved to Mexico. I like packed up everything that I knew and, uh, moved to Mexico with my husband and my dog. Which by the way, I was just thinking earlier when you said, oh yeah, my friends who live in studio apartments. And I thought you must be so happy you moved to Mexico. You're probably on a hacienda. Uh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, yeah. (laughs) We, we have a, we have a really beautiful and spacious property here in Mexico. Amazing. Yeah, it's great. Um, but I've, I've changed in that I, I feel like I am more resilient. Um, I, I feel like I've naturally always been a resilient person. I've always been able to pat, bounce back from things. I, um, I've had several severe traumas in my life ranging from sexual abuse to my parents' divorce to coming out and being rejected and disowned and all that. And, um, and I, and coming to a different country and moving to a different country is a completely different experience that I've never had in my life. It is like, I mean, I I lived in a Bay area my entire life and I went from living in the Bay area to moving to a country that doesn't speak the language where the majority of people don't look like me and I am the outsider and that was a huge like ooh, whoa I knew that that was going to happen like I of course like I prepped myself but I didn't realize how um lonely that would feel for me and how isolating that would feel for me um and so I guess in my loneliness and like in my relationship with myself I've become I feel like I've become more resilient um, in the last five to 10 years, so 10 years ago, I had just come out, uh, and, um, I was just exploring what it meant to be a gay man. I didn't really know what that was. And so I was exploring this new identity of myself and, um, becoming more and more authentic and doing more and more things that I wanted to do and hanging out with people that I, that accepted me. Um, and within that time, I... Um, I had to abandon an identity that I had been carrying along <laughs> from the majority of my life, a mask of heterosexuality, a mask of uh, Mike Sagoon, the, the straight man, and then transition into Mike Sagoon, the openly gay and proud man. And, um, and that was a transition. It, it, it happened over a course of several years. It didn't happen overnight. And so... Um, in the last 10 years, I think I've changed in that I've really started to understand who I was at my core. And I think in your 20s, like in your 20s, it's like you're still kind of experimenting with your personality, you know? It's yeah, like, probably forever. But yes, I would say there more than any other and time. And like... And in my 20s, I was definitely experimenting with my, with who I was as a person. And so um, I think five years ago, that would have made me 27, um, 28, I was, I had just gotten married, right? So from, okay, so from 10 years to five years, I had met my now husband and got married. I'd come out, met my partner, and then I had, and then I got married. Wow. 
right? And then in the last five years, I've uh, gotten into my 30s, picked up my entire life from uh, America and moved to Mexico. Yeah. And so I would say that, yeah, I think resilience is like the biggest thing there. Is like just bouncing back from these these hard times, these tough times in my life. It was interesting. Just this morning, I was listening to, um, I was on a walk and I was listening to How I Built This, which I love. Great podcast. And at the end of every single interview, he asks people, how much of your success is due to, you know, skill, talent, grit, whatever, and how much is due to luck? And the woman said 50-50, but she said, but it's not just, you know, grinding it out. I think it's resilience. And so it was really interesting how she distinguished those. And I haven't really sat down to thought about, to, to think about it that much, but it, it kind of struck me the, the importance in kind of just grinding through things versus I think rising above and being able to continue through uh-huh. them rather under them. There was something there that I, I, I found interesting in that differentiation that, that she made. Yeah. Um, when you were talking about how you were beginning to explore your own identity and authenticity, I think that, you know, we talked about in, the, in one's 20s, how that's a huge phase, but I think that's something that continues throughout life or should at least as long as, as we live, because there are always new versions of ourselves, new opportunities presenting themselves, perhaps, you know, you go through some life change, you get out of a relationship, new opportunity. Who are you without that person? You know, some people are losing their jobs. These are constant opportunities and also things that force us to really try and figure out who we are through a new light from a, from a different angle. And so I guess if you had any lessons or tips for how to help people explore their own identity and continue to kind of grow with it or, or challenge it, et cetera. Yeah. I think, you know, our history is, is such great curriculum for our lives. Like looking back at our lives and looking at all the things that did work and the things that didn't work. And also I feel like our problems are our curriculum for our life as well. And so if things aren't, if things aren't working in our lives and what do we need to change? What, what's, what's the shift there? And um, looking at our own identity, I think when we look back at our history and we notice, oh, like, I think I identify as, I identify as a straight man because I've always been taught that I'm supposed to be straight. I grew up, and I'm speaking from my own experience. This is my own story, my own history. Uh, This is actually part of why I came out, is that I started to think like, okay, I've always been taught that I needed to be a straight man. I was always taught that being gay was, was bad and like, you're a sinner if you're gay. And am I that person? Am I that person? And do I want to stay that person? And then I went through a phase and I came out and here I am. And then I went through a phase where in my early 20s and my mid 20s, I was like, I was partying a lot. Love going out, love going to the club, love just like hanging out all night. You know, I was, I, I, like my friends would call me Party Mike. Right? Really? Oh yeah. Like Mike was a party starter. So Everyone knew that every time I walked through those doors, like, okay, cool, it is time for oh my us to God. party. Let's I do this. love this version of Mike, but I also would <laughs> love to know and hang out with that version of Mike. I mean, that 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 version of Mike is still there, right? Like, I yeah, could right, right, him. right, exactly. I could, I could, I could totally access him. Right? Oh my God, but, next time. But it was like, but that identity, this party Mike identity, as I got, I was starting to get into my later 20s was um was so much I was like this on he's still there <laughs> yeah I know yeah Ebenezer's seen Potty Mike he's still there he comes out on the retreat sometime <laughs> after out. dark with the <laughs> strobe light headlamp I definitely had I didn't put on my headlamp but I definitely had a <laughs> dance party by myself in the dark the other night you need to do that 
Yeah, somebody accents. sent me this song on WhatsApp where it creates surround sound. So you put on yeah, headphones 18. and you listen to it. Yeah, whatever that one is. And uh-huh. I That's put awesome. it on and was like, well, I should probably just turn out the lights while I'm here and, you know, dance by myself in the club <laughs> with the surround sound. It worked really well. So that was Party Mike. Party Mike was just like, let's just dance our butts off all night. I let's hang it. out all night and night and I got into my later 20s and it was just like weekend after weekend and that was just, I knew that I wasn't honoring who I was as a person and I was just getting tired right like I didn't I didn't want to do this anymore but there was an identity that I had to let go of which was this party mic identity and there was this piece of me that was like wow I got to tell my friends that this is not what I want to do anymore oh, right yeah and so I had to let go a piece of that and so I, um, I went through this transition in my later 20s of like saying no to friends when they wanted to go out mm-hmm. and really checking in and like checking in with myself. Like, it, am I, do I want to go out because I'm lonely right now? Or do I want to go out because I want to have fun? Or do I want to mm. go out because I'm like trying to distract myself from something else? Right, right. From right. doing some work. And, and, and so I had, to, I had to train the people in my life <clears throat> And let them know, like, this is not who I am anymore. I don't want to be this person anymore. I don't want to be the guy that goes out every night and gets the party started. I'll, I'll, I'll get your party started twice a year, but not every weekend, right? Like, let's, we could get that party mic every once in a while, but not right. every weekend. And so, like, like, we have an opportunity to let go of our identities, identities that aren't serving us anymore. That the, the straight mic, the heterosexual mic, was not serving me anymore. Party mic was not serving me anymore. And I think what we see so often is in men tie their identities up with work, with mm-hmm. accomplishments, with their families. And when those identities get lost, like say, for instance, the kids leave the nest, they go off to college or they mm-hmm. lose a job, or they retire, all of a sudden, these men are like, well, who the hell am I without any of these things? Who am I without this job? Who am I without my kids? Who am I without my family? And that becomes really difficult for guys to kind of grasp who this new identity, who this new person can be, or who they want to be, and they don't even know where to start, right? I think I heard kind of a big difference between these two different things because there was kind of straight Mike who was an inauthentic version of you. And so those ones that truly don't serve us, that aren't a part of who we are, those are the ones we need to let go of versus party Mike and these other identities that in some ways are authentic to who we are. We need to figure out how to integrate them perhaps in a different way. And you mentioned the biggest difference I picked up on is not what we're doing it. It was the why behind it. And so when you said, okay, I was going out, maybe if somebody's going out to distract themselves or because they're lonely, it's coming from this other place versus now when party might comes out, it is just probably to have fun, to connect, to dance because you love it. And so the actions themselves aren't, that different and the only reason the frequency is different is because that part that was inauthentic or that didn't serve you which was the unhealthy why behind it you let go of that and you integrated the authentic part into yourself yeah yeah absolutely which i think it's really I interesting yeah yeah absolutely i mean there there's always going to be a piece of our personalities where we can look at and say is this part of my personality serving me still Mm-hmm. Is this is this growing me as a person? Is this helping me connect with people, yeah. or is it pushing people away? Yeah. And we all have the ability to shift who we are. We can shift every single piece of who we are. It just takes awareness and it takes effort. Yeah. We have to intentionally do that, right? Like, I could I I could be intentional about bringing party mic out. I you will totally be, be someday. And I will be. And yeah, I will with, be there for it. With Sasha and Ebenezer. <laughs> P.S. I'm waiting for when I can go on an everyman retreat. So yeah. BDXX needs to be involved to make that happen. 
the other day, I was telling somebody a few weeks ago, I said, I really want to learn more about retreats. I want to go on a retreat, da, 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 learn what they're about because maybe we want to do some someday. And somebody said, okay, well, the best way is to go on one. I said, yeah, but the ones I want to go on the most are for men only, so I can't go. And then there was one other one that's cool, but it's for couples. So I was like, well, I think the one I'm looking for doesn't really exist yet, so I need to make it, but... How can you how can you facilitate your own retreat and be a participant? Well, now time? it's going to be a virtual one, so it'll be easier. <laughs> Everybody will just pretend they're in Bali. Oh, oh there, there's there, maybe there's a maybe in every man we're going to do a retreat called Everybody. Yes. Oh yeah. Everybody, <laughs> get your body. Okay, yeah. so I have. <laughs> Yes, and there will be live performances. Absolutely. By us. And by Party Mike. By Party Which, Mike. Now that I'm thinking about it, it just sounds too much like Magic Mike. Or just <laughs> not too much, but just <laughs> fantastically sounds like... I'll take, I'll take Magic Mike. <laughs> like, Eb- Ebenezer's thinking now. Ebenezer's like, hmm, yeah, a retreat a new for retreat. everybody. <laughs> huh. <laughs> yes, I love it. We'll talk about that. So I have one more sub question and then clearly we need to have another Instagram live soon because we, I've asked you one of the questions on my list, but <laughs> and the next Instagram live will be five hours long. It will be a retreat and it's called everybody. <laughs> everybody BBXX. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and hey, you know, hugs are, you know, like XOXO. Hugs Everybody, XOXO, something like that. Yeah, there you go. Okay, so when you were talking about how you moved to Mexico and learning about your identity, and I was thinking because you had just talked about how you had left behind this identity of Mike as a straight man, and then you, you know, integrated as we talked about this identity of party Mike. And so with all of that, you had to kind of carry your past along with you and this baggage or the same people knew you in one way as the other way. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, well, when you went to Mexico, was this an opportunity to then start over? And just Mm -hmm. the other day with a friend who moved, I posed the question to her, can people start truly start over like have a fresh start and I'm, I'm curious what you, what you would say before we moved here <clears throat> my husband and I took like a trip to visit our house to like just check on things and we we're sitting at an art gallery um, having a drink or something and he's like what are you most excited about moving to Mexico and what are you gonna miss and I said well I'm definitely gonna miss our homies our friends our tribe so much and that's still true today um, but I'm looking forward to, to starting a new group of friends because I get to start off without them knowing anything about who I was. And I get to just start off as who I am today. This is who I am. This is who you're going to get. And um, I think there's something really powerful about that, that I get, like, we all have an opportunity. I, we all, I always hear this from guys that come, go to men's retreats or go to a men's group, they come back home and um, all of a sudden they're like, I need to change my friends. Like, yeah. I don't, I don't think I connect with my friends anymore. And then through the journey of this development that they are going through after attending a men's retreat or a men's group, they start to attract the people that they want to attract in their mm-hmm. lives because they get to be more authentic with who they are. And there's, there isn't this, like, invisible barrier of, like, oh, they know this past, this part of me, and now I have to let go of this person. I can just be who I am right now and who, this, who, who Mike is in this very moment. Mm-hmm. And I think there's something really powerful about that. And there's always this question for me of, well, you know, I have friends in California that I've known for, God, 20 years, right? And so it is my responsibility as their friend to say, hey, I want to shift the piece of our relationship and I want, I want our relationship to look a little different. 
And this is how I think our relationship can look different. I want to have deeper talks with you. I don't want to talk about like, I don't want to talk about sports anymore. I don't want to talk about like all this kind of stuff. I don't want that to be the main part of our conversation. I want us to get to know each other on a deeper level, right? So we have the opportunity to do that. It's hard. It's difficult. When we meet new people, we can just be who we are. And that just attracts mm -hmm. the people that we want. Yeah. And I think it's particularly moving and all these things is a great opportunity to start over. But then I think there is also the question of, as they say, how our reactions to the present are shaped by all of our past experiences. So you can start over, but is it a fresh start in the sense of, you know, if you're still incorporating the, the lessons you learned, the past experiences that have shaped you, how much is it that, that integration versus, you know, a new you? Yeah, and how much of that past of the, the things that you didn't want to bring into this relationship, how much of it are you actually bringing into this relationship? Yeah, yeah, kind of how much of it is, is unavoidable in a way. Or, you know, some of it, if it's lessons that were learned maybe through negative experiences but that had a positive outcome, positive lesson learned, things that, you know, maybe you do want to carry over because they helped create the new you, but they came from an older version of you or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. What next? Another question number two. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> what is one of the best compliments you've received? Mm. And then any actually, thoughts actually, of, you know, the art of complimenting in general? Because I think yeah. some people, you know, aren't comfortable with compliments. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> the other day somebody said something and then I just kept talking and they, go, did you not hear me? And I said, oh, no, yeah, I did. I, I did. Just, <laughs> I just chose to talk over that's you. That's <laughs> just how I deal with compliments. I just keep talking and don't acknowledge <laughs> them because apparently that is what uh, I do. Because they had said the compliment, then I kept going. They said it again, and then I kept going, and then they stopped me to clarify if I hadn't heard them. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and then there's something – about the art of complimenting and how, you know, you can give a generic compliment versus something that is unique to the person or something that is superficial versus about something more. So yeah, I'd just love to hear your thoughts. Yeah. So um, I actually just got a really great compliment today uh, from a guy that's part of my like men's community. Um, he had attended one of my men's groups and he, he sent me a message and he said, thank you so much for last week. You really know how to help men feel warm and included. And I was like, that is an incredible compliment. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. I mean, that is, that's my work, right? My work is helping guys feel safe with me so that they can be open and connected and, and, and share. And, um, and, and the art of complimenting, right? So yeah. here's, here's my thing about compliments. The true art. The true art. Compliments are a gift. They are a gift to you. And so if ignoring it or saying, no, 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 that's not true. Or saying, no, no, like what, what am I, yeah. what, the things that I, that, like one of my things that like, irks me is when I go, oh, I really love how you, you um, I really love how you said that because it really made me feel safe. And they go, and when you said that one thing earlier, that really made me feel safe too, right? Or like when you're like, oh, I really love how your hair looks. And they're like, I love your hair too. It looks really good. Like they, they kind of like mirror the yeah. compliment back. Like that's like one of my biggest things. A compliment is a gift. And if you reject it or you say, no, 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 no. Yeah. Or you kind of give a compliment back. What you're saying is, I don't want your gift. Mm. Take it, take it back, right? And, and also on the other side of this is, it takes a lot of guts for someone to give a compliment. Mm -hmm. And it, it's vulnerable. It is very vulnerable to offer someone a compliment. And by, by saying, hey, um, I, I'm going to talk over you or, or uh, I'm not going to accept <laughs> that or whatever it is. It, yeah. It, it, it's, you're dishonoring <laughs> that gift. But also, you're also, you might be saying, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not open to seeing your vulnerability right now and I'm rejecting your vulnerability. 
Yeah. And so compliments are beautiful because compliments are a gift from another person to you. And all we need to do is say, wow, thank you so much. Thanks. Yeah. That's a great compliment. Thank you. Right. Because if somebody gives you a gift, you're not going to just keep talking. <laughs> I mean, people, hands I mean, you something and you're not going to just like shove it behind you, like <laughs> put it up your shirt and try and hide it. Um, I, I, so I, I kind of love that idea. And it made me think too, that when people do give us gifts, they often are kind of forgotten or, you know, it stowed away, or maybe we use it. And you know, I don't know if it's a candle and it burns out and then there's nothing kind of left of it. Or it's something we use for a while and then we, you know, don't have a use for anymore. Or we get bored or tired of it versus really amazing compliments or something that we are going to go back to throughout our entire life. If you remember some of these, that purpose, you know, those things that feed into not only motivating you, but reinforcing who you are and that you know, with those cumulative compliments, without them, it would probably be much harder for you to continue doing your work and and motivate and, and grow and create something bigger. And so when you have that later on, that is going to be in part, you know, maybe a small part, maybe in large part due to these gifts other people have given you, which are really kind of thank yous in a way, you know, they're thank you gifts because you've given them something back and that's why they wanted to give you this gift in the first place. Yeah. And they, they felt something because of something that you did or because of your presence. And if we can help someone feel and, and it, and it gives them the courage to compliment you on how they feel Take it. Take the gift. That's mm-hmm. they're they are honoring you. Yeah. Okay. We have limited time, so I'm just gonna go with yes. one more question and I'll make it I I glanced down at some of them and was like, oh that's like a 20 minute question. So that <laughs> one was like half of them. Um <laughs> so I will ask you what would be one of the unhealthiest periods and healthiest periods of your life. And that can be in the literal sense or in the metaphorical sense or however you want to interpret it. Um, There's a period in my life, uh, you said unhealthy and healthy? Mm -hmm. So right, like the year before I came out, I um, had this like streak of really unhealthy behavior. Um, where I was exploring what it was to be a gay man, but behind the closet and doing it very, like, in very, like, and I had a lot of risky behaviors along with it. Um, One, I was clouded in shame. Uh, I was sleeping with basically strangers and finding strangers online and going out to one night stands and like meeting people, meeting guys in their homes or like in their cars or like wherever it was so that I could explore. And also, so like I was a fucking 20 something year young, 20 year something year old man. Yeah. And I had fucking Which, hormones, right? Like yeah. I'm horny as fuck. Like I want to have sex, but here yeah. I am. I'm, I'm, I have all these risky behaviors that are attached to me exploring what it means to be gay. And I wasn't even out yet. Right. And so I had to do it secretly and behind closed doors. And I was like meeting guys late at night and like not even knowing these guys. And it was like super, super unhealthy. And then we, and then you feel the shame with alcohol and then Mm -hmm. you feel the shame with marijuana. And then you feel the shame with going out and partying with your straight friends. And so like, it's just just like this cycle, right? Mm -hmm. Like I have so much shame for taking on these risky behaviors. And then to feel better about myself, I go hang out and do partake in more risky behaviors Mm -hmm. to numb this shame that I feel. And then I'm going to go do it all over again. Yeah. So it was like this constant cycle of shame and toxic behaviors. And um, it was, yeah, it was scary. 
And I think a lot of people, regardless, you know, I could say regardless of if they're exploring their, their sexuality or not, but who isn't? Not even in the sense of are you straight or are you gay, that binary, and not even having to do with gender. Like, who, how is my identity tied to other people, tied to sex, tied to sexuality, the way I express myself intimately, any of that? But yeah. unfortunately, I think a lot of people's experiences in their in their young 20s particularly in college or shortly after probably could I'm sure a lot of people unfortunately can relate to that yeah yeah um healthiest healthiest part of my life um I've had so many healthy moments in my life I the last the the latest healthiest actually my my brother Tom Henley just logged on here he and I did a 30-day challenge uh last month where we didn't drink any alcohol, we and we exercise at least three times a week, cut out carbs, um, and it was. I mean, I still feel great from it, uh, and like physically felt really feel really good, emotionally feel really good, getting better sleep, um, way more present. Um, yeah. So ju- yeah, just recently. Hello, Rafa. Hi, Rafa. A good friend from from Chile. She just logged on Rafaela um so and as we close out unfortunately we're doing in 2.0 very soon but it was just interesting because a lot of what I hear is unhealthy behaviors stem from you know trying to maintain these versions of ourselves that don't serve us or being inauthentic versions of ourselves and that cognitive dissonance or that shame that comes from that and sort of I think a lot of it too, isn't necessarily the way that I think a lot of us think about healthy versus unhealthy, I think no longer serves us in such, I went to a Stanford health conference about a year or two ago. And I remember this man who I loved his entire talk. I don't remember his name. I need to look it up, but he said, raise your hand if you're healthy. And a lot of people in the room raised their hand. And I remember wondering, you know, thinking to myself, because at that time, and in general, you know, I was eating extremely healthy. I was exercising on a regular basis. I was also dealing with two chronic diseases. I was in constant, constant chronic pain. And I think I was at that point on month 10 straight of every day. And I just remember sitting there thinking, okay, well, is healthy? Does it have to do with my behaviors? Does it have to do with my health status? Does it have to do with my mental health? Because at that point, emotionally and mentally, I was falling apart. And so really to think of what does it mean to be healthy and how should we, because at that same time, when I was going through all these issues at my co-work, I would be there and for breakfast, I would make something that, and every day somebody would comment, oh, you're so healthy. And I was on this insane, weird diet. It wasn't even that healthy, but in in Chile, I think compared to California, it's a bit different, but Uh it wasn't, you know, I was also doing these weird things to try and counteract all the, the problems I was having with my health. And so one, when we look at other people, you know, how much do we know about them and, and for ourselves, you know, what does healthy mean to you? What is the healthy version of you? And it might have nothing to do with the way you eat or exercise, but how you maintain balance and what's going on up here and how you're connecting to other people. And this whole thing about, you know, in nutrition, uh, the, the type of integrative health that Joe does and, um, our friend Nati, who's a coach in Chile, and they talk about the food chain and how the primary foods are that fulfillment, our relationships and all of that. And before we have, Mm. you know, we're feeding ourselves, nourishing ourselves with the primary foods that are not things we eat and drink at all. You know, we take, we need to take care of those first. And until then the the stuff we're filling our body with doesn't actually matter as much because it can't outweigh and outbalance those primary foods. Yeah, love that. That's so great. challenge to everybody uh, who has listened now or in the future would be to think of what, you know, 
the health, what health, being healthy means to you and how you mm-hmm. want to be that, that version of you. That's right. So yeah. thank you so much for joining us. Thank it you for having It was wonderful yes. to talk to you. We have a lot more questions to get through. So at some point, point oh, out. and I thought it should be everybody is a lover is what our Love retreat that. can be called. So everybody is a lover. Yeah. Duly noted. Ebenezer, you got that? Boom. <laughs> Okay, cool. Thank you so much and look forward to talking with you again soon.